You are listening to The Evidence Locker. Our cases have been researched using open source and archive materials. It deals with true crimes and real people. Each episode is produced with the utmost respect to the victims, their families, and loved ones. It was September 7th, 1996, a balmy night in Las Vegas, Nevada. Thousands of people flocked to the glitzy city to watch the heavyweight title boxing match between Mike Tyson and Bruce Sheldon. It was the hottest ticket in town. Celebrities and millionaires streamed into the MGM Grand to watch the fight. It only took Tyson 50 seconds to knock Sheldon out. Some spectators had not even made it to their seats yet and it was all over. However. Tyson and Sheldon's was not the only fight of the night. Around 8.30, an altercation had broken out in the main lobby of the MGM Grand. The man who threw the first punch was hip-hop sensation Tupac Shakur. His entourage jumped in to support him, but the fight did not last long. Security guards at the MGM broke it up in half a minute. The man at the receiving end of the punch-up was a man called Orlando Anderson. He composed himself and told security guards that he did not want to press charges, and it was left at that. Tupac and his men went to the hotel where he was staying, so he could change and get ready for his midnight performance at a new club owned by his music producer and manager, Marion Suge Knight. But he never did make it to that performance. By the end of the night, the 25-year-old Tupac Shakur would be dead. In the mid-1990s, Tupac Shakur was a household name. Tupac, also known at the time by his alias, Machiavelli, is consistently ranked as one of the most influential rappers to ever hold a microphone. His album All Eyes On Me, along with his greatest hits, were among the best-selling albums in the United States. But the road to the top of hip-hop wasn't always a smooth one. In fact, It was his tough childhood that inspired most of his lyrics and his poetry. His vision was to connect with the people in the ghetto on an inspirational level. He wanted to tell what he saw on the streets, violence, injustice, prejudice, and he did so in a very eloquent and poetic way. Tupac was born on June 16, 1971 in East Harlem, New York. When he was born, his name was Lassane Parrish Crooks. A year later, his mother changed his name to Tupac, which means Shining Serpent. He was named after Tupac Amaru II, a Peruvian revolutionary who was executed after leading an indigenous uprising against Spanish rule. His parents, Afini Shakur and Billy Garland, were both active members of the far-left Black Panther Party. In fact, when Afini was pregnant with Tupac, She stood trial for more than 150 charges of conspiracy against the United States government and New York landmarks. Afini, heavily pregnant, defended herself in court, calling witnesses and arguing her case. In May 1971, a month before Tupac was born, his mother was acquitted of all charges. When he was growing up, Tupac's father was hardly ever around. It was up to Afini to raise her son, and she did the best she could. They lived in extreme poverty, and Tupac was exposed to life on the streets from a very young age. However, he found his escape in poetry and in literature. To escape the grim realities surrounding him, he read a lot. He would attribute a lot of his success as an artist to growing up with books. In 1986, Afini and Tupac moved to Baltimore. After two years at a public high school, his mom managed to enroll him at the Baltimore School of Arts. There, Tupac thrived. 
From day one, it was clear that this passionate young man had a flair for performing, be it acting, dancing, or rapping. There was something special about Tupac. He could perform in a Shakespeare play and then compete in a rap battle and win. But despite his success at school, I was not well at the home front. Afini had boyfriends. Sometimes they would turn abusive and she would not let Tupac defend her. Baltimore was also one of the most dangerous cities in the States at the time. The situation was reaching boiling point, so Afini thought it would be safer for Tupac to move to California where he could stay with relatives. Tupac lived in an area five miles or eight kilometers north of San Francisco called Marin City. As it turns out, life in Marin City was not so much different to life in Baltimore. The area was known for its frequent fistfights, and Tupac never shied away from a fight. He was familiar with life on the streets and violence did not scare him. When his mother moved to California to join him, their relationship took some strain. Afini was a crack addict and Tupac hated the world of drugs and addiction. But in that environment, he was soon drawn into selling drugs himself. After dealing for a while, he realized that this was not the life he wanted. It affected him deeply if people would offer family heirlooms or wedding rings in exchange for drugs. He couldn't handle it anymore. So he went back to what he was best at, rapping. In high school, he wrote an English paper titled Conquering All Obstacles. In it, he wrote, Our raps, not the sorry story raps everyone is so tired of. They are about what happens in the real world. Our goal is to have people relate to our raps, making it easier to see what really is happening out there. Even more important, what we may do to better our world. Tupac formed his first rap group, Strictly Dope, around this time. He caught the eye of Shock G, a well-known name on the Oakland rap scene. He offered Tupac an opportunity to perform as a dancer and MC with his group, Digital Underground. This was just the break that Tupac needed. He went on a world tour with Digital Underground. Tupac graduated from dancer to the mic during the tour, with great reaction of fans. Tupac featured with Digital Underground on the soundtrack to the film Nothing But Trouble, and he also appeared with the group in the film itself. His time with Digital Underground had launched him. He was ready to do his own thing. In November 1991, he released his debut album, Tupacalypse Now. He was rapping about the cold reality of living on the streets. His songs stand up for the downtrodden and people who thought there was no way out. The album did not have any hit songs, but it certainly put Tupac on the map. Songs like Brenda's Got a Baby and Trapped cause a stir for commenting on social injustice. When a young man accused of shooting a state trooper in Texas said he was inspired to do so after listening to Tupac's album, Vice President Dan Quayle said, There's no reason for a record like this to be released. It has no place in our society. Despite its controversy, Tupacalypse Now was certified gold by the Recording Industry Association of America. Tupac wasn't only climbing the billboards, he was making his mark at the box office as well. He loved acting since his high school days, and after his stint in Nothing But Trouble with Digital Underground, he was eager to make more films. Juice was his first leading role, followed by succeeding roles in Poetic Justice, Above the Rim, and the posthumously released Bullet, Gridlocked, and Gang Related. He managed to juggle a rocketing movie career at the same time as he was acing his music career. In 1993, Tupac formed a group Thug Life with some friends and his older stepbrother Mo Prime, Khamenei Shakur. They released their first album, Thug Life Volume 1, in September 1993, and it went gold. He loved recording, and according to his cousin, Jamala Lassane, Tupac was probably his own biggest fan. Whenever he listened to his own music, he would say, Oh my God, the boy is nice. And that he sure was. He connected with men, women, black, white, old and young. Tupac was adamant that he had to stay real. This was the only way he would connect to the people he felt he was writing for, the kids on the streets, 
kids who were living in the ghetto as he once did. British writer Rob Marriott described Tupac's signature way of tying his bandana into rabbit ears as one of gangster rap's most recognizable style choices. In his early 20s, Tupac was a rising star. He met a girl called Keisha Morris in a nightclub and fell in love. But it was a complicated time for him. Even though success came to Tupac, it came saddled with envy and trouble. He had a loud mouth and wasn't scared to say the truth of what he thought about anyone and everyone from the U.S. government to drug dealers. Tupac was proud to call himself a thug. I'm going to say that I'm a thug. That's because I'm from the gutter and I'm still here. He was a hot-headed loudmouth and that often landed him in trouble. Trouble that he would face fists up. In LA, he was convicted of assaulting a music video producer after a disagreement. At a concert at Michigan State University, he assaulted a local rapper with a baseball bat, a fight that had bought him 10 days in jail. In New York, a female fan accused Tupac and three of his friends of sexually assaulting her in a hotel room. It was in the time of his trial that he was courting Keisha Morris. In fact, he stayed with her in her apartment. Keisha was young and did not know what to believe, but Tupac was very serious about her. He treated her with respect and she was in love with him. Although the circumstances for their courtship wasn't ideal, their relationship was strong. On the night of November 30th, 1994, as he arrived at the Quad Recording Studios in Manhattan, he was ambushed. Tupac was shot at close range, five times. He was also robbed of all his jewelry, valued at $40,000. He was rushed to the hospital and survived the attack. Less than five hours after the surgery and against doctor's orders, Tupac released himself from the hospital. He was on trial and he had to appear in court. Still recovering from this attack and attending court in his wheelchair, Tupac was acquitted of sodomy and weapons charges, but found guilty of sexual abuse or forcibly touching the woman's buttocks. He was sentenced to the maximum time, up to four and a half years behind bars. Before he went to prison, Tupac proposed to Keisha Morris. She visited him as often as she could, daily if it were possible. The couple married four months into his prison stint. After Tupac had served 10 months of his four and a half year sentence, his album, Me Against the World, went platinum and remained at the top of the Billboard 200 charts for over four weeks. This was when he received a visit from Suge Knight, the godfather of hip hop. Suge, founder of Death Row Records alongside Dr. Dre, offered Tupac a deal. He would finance Tupac's appeal and pay the appellate bond of $1.4 million if Tupac would sign a record deal with Death Row Records. Tupac was ready to resume his freedom and agreed to the deal. He was released in October 1995 and went straight to the recording studio to record the album All Eyes On Me. In 1996, Tupac and Keisha had their marriage annulled. They were both very young and felt that they had married for the wrong reasons. Keisha went back to New York, and Tupac stayed in California. The album All Eyes On Me sold over 5 million copies, outselling the Rolling Stones and Madonna. It went platinum in only three weeks. He had been etched into music history, a force to be reckoned with. In an interview in Spain, American music journalist Chuck Phillips commented on the rise of a new kind of poet. I like sacred texts myths, proverbs, and scriptures. When Tupac came along, I thought he was quite the poet. It wasn't just how cleverly they rhymed. It wasn't just the rhythm or the cadence. I liked their attitude. It was the protest music in a way nobody had ever thought about before. These artists were brave, wise, and smart, wickedly smart. Tupac had so many sides, he wasn't afraid to write about his vulnerabilities. Tupac had the world at his feet. He had many famous friends like Snoop Dogg, Rosie Perez, Marlon Wayans, Jim Carrey, and Jada Pinkett Smith. Jada and Tupac were actually very close. He said that she was his heart and that she would be his friend for his whole life. He even wrote a poem titled Jada that was published in his book, The Rose That Grew From Concrete. One of Tupac's very close friends was a rapper from the East Coast named Christopher Wallace. 
otherwise known as the Notorious B.I.G., or Biggie Smalls as his friends called him. The two rappers had a lot in common. They both grew up poor without fathers in neighborhoods where crime was rife and drugs were a part of life. While Tupac grew up in East Harlem and Baltimore, and Biggie grew up in Brooklyn's bed Biggie often rapped about criminality and violence in bed so both were storytellers of their circumstances. Around 1993, Tupac Shakur was just slightly ahead in the rap game, but he mentored his friend Biggie and let him crash on his couch whenever Biggie would visit California. Biggie's first break came when his album, Ready to Die, went platinum. Many people felt that Biggie's music echoed Tupac's style. In the wake of his newfound fame, Biggie never mentioned Tupac's input and mentorship. After everything Tupac had done for Biggie, he had expected more from him. Biggie was signed with Sean P. Diddy Combs' label, Bad Boy Records. Combs and Biggie were also good friends. They were looking ahead to the big time for Biggie, who was recording under the stage name of the Notorious B.I.G. Before Biggie's landmark album, West Coast rap was the most prominent on U.S. charts. But when East Coast rappers had a hat in the ring and rivalry was about to rev up, the media had a field day, blowing up the situation between once friends, Tupac and Biggie. It was believed that their feud sparked the whole rivalry between East Coast and West Coast rappers. Things took a turn for the worse when Tupac blamed Biggie, Sean Combs, and their associates for orchestrating his robbery and shooting in November 1994. Biggie and his entourage were in the recording studios when Tupac arrived, but he denied having prior knowledge of the attack. Tupac wanted to set the record straight regarding this rivalry. This is all about my image. It has nothing to do with me. I'm selling records. That's what I do for a living. Don't get it twisted. This is not my real life. This is not how my real life is supposed to be. I'm not supposed to have all these villains in my life. In 1995, after Tupac's release from prison, when he signed with Death Row Records, the feud grew even more intense. Death Row and Bad Boy did not see eye to eye. And now Tupac was with Death Row, and Biggie was with Bad Boy. The labels were also affiliated with the Crip and Blood gangs. Crip members were always seen wearing blue and Bloods red. It's no secret that the gangs were in a constant state of conflict in the 1990s. With his love for acting in theater, Tupac understood the Shakespearean psychology of inter-gang wars and intercultural conflict. This is what he said in an interview in 1995 comparing the East Coast-West Coast rivalry to a Shakespearean drama. I love Shakespeare. He wrote some of the raw stories, man. I mean, look at Romeo and Juliet. That's some serious ghetto shit. You got this guy Romeo from the Bloods who falls for Juliet, a female from the Crips, and everybody in both gangs is against them. So they have to sneak out and they end up dead for nothing. Real tragic stuff. And look how Shakespeare busts it up with Macbeth. He creates a tale about this king's wife who convinces a happy man to chase after her and kill her husband so he can take over the country. After he commits the murder, the dude starts having delusions just like in a Scarface song. I mean, the king's wife just screws this guy's whole life up for nothing. In June 1996, Tupac was still fuming after being shot and sent to jail. To retaliate, he did what he did best and wrote a song about it. The song turned out to be a battle song launching war against Biggie and his whole bad boy crew. Hit em Up was the ultimate provocation tactic explicitly calling out names within the song itself. In it, Tupac even claims that he slept with Biggie's wife, R&B singer Faith Evans. Some of the lyrics that Tupac had written within the song go, You claim to be a player but I f***ed your wife. Grab your Glocks when you see Tupac. Call the cops when you see Tupac O. And lastly, Now it's all about Versace, you copied my style. Five shots couldn't drop me, I took it and smiled. Now I'm back to set the record straight with my AKM so the thug that you love to hate. Biggie was enraged, especially about Tupac's claim that he had slept with Biggie's wife. Rumor has it that Biggie said to gang members that he was willing to pay big money for Tupac to be killed. Tupac was chuffed that he could finally say what he wanted to say. He knew that it would get under Biggie's skin, and he loved every moment. When his bodyguard Frank Alexander heard the song, he knew that Tupac was looking for trouble. 
He jokingly suggested that they should get more security. On September 6, 1996, Tupac was recording a music video at Lacey Studios in downtown LA. After a long day, he went to his apartment in Calabasas that he shared with his fiance, Kadada Jones. Kadada is the daughter of music industry icon Quincy Jones. When Tupac arrived home, he was so exhausted he went straight to bed. When he woke up, his cousin, Jamal al was there. She reminded him that they were due in Las Vegas later that day. It was the day of the heavyweight title fight between Tyson and Sheldon, and Tupac's midnight performance at a Las Vegas nightclub. Tupac didn't really want to go. He had some family issues, but with pressure from his record producer, Suge Knight, he did go along. Tupac, Kadada, Jamala, and the rest of his entourage arrived in Vegas at 3 p.m. By this time, Tupac's spirits were so high and he was eager to start gambling. He made his way to the craps table and Lady Luck was smiling. He did pretty well. His good friends, the members of his backup group, Outlaw Immortals, joined him and cheered him on. After an afternoon of happy gambling, Tupac and his entourage went back to their hotel to freshen up. He said his girlfriend and cousin should stay in the hotel room when the guys went to the boxing match. The ladies weren't all too happy about being left behind, but Tupac, having had a premonition, pleaded with them not to go out. Not wanting to argue, they agreed, and Tupac went out on a boys' night with the men in his entourage. When they arrived at the MGM Grand to watch the fight, it was no surprise that Tupac's rival caused quite a stir. Adoring fans called out his name, women wanted to touch him, he was revered. But his bodyguard was on high alert, still nervous after the provoking release of Hit Him Up. Frank Alexander knew that the dig at Biggie would upset many people. So as the crowd closed in on Tupac at the MGM, his bodyguard asked some security guards for assistance in moving through the main arena. The men went through to watch Tyson's fight, which seemed to be over before it started. Afterwards, they went to the locker room to congratulate Tyson as he was good friends with Tupac. There was a lot of excitement in the air as they left Tyson. Everybody was pumped up about the 50-second knockout. As they walked, they were throwing air punches and laughing. Tupac's crew that night consisted of Tupac, Suge, bodyguards, and some gang members who were part of the Bloods who were on death row's payroll. When the group walked into the lobby of the MGM Grand, one of the gang members noticed someone standing by the elevators. He stepped to Tupac and whispered into his ear and had all of the rap star's attention. The man standing by the elevator was called Orlando Baby Lane Anderson. He was a member of the Southside Crips. Months earlier, Orlando had robbed and beaten one of Tupac's bodyguards in a footlocker store in Lakeview. To add insult to injury, Anderson also ripped the prized death row medallion from the bodyguard's neck, a metaphorical middle finger to Suge Knight and the Bloods. The Bloods were not going to let him get away with this, and seeing Anderson all by himself was like fate serving him up on a silver platter. Tupac headed straight for Anderson and reportedly said, You from the South? But Tupac did not give Anderson a chance to answer and threw a punch at him. At this point, Tupac's entourage joined in kicking and fighting. Frank Alexander grabbed Tupac and pulled him out of the fight. When MGM security guards stepped in, the fight stopped. The whole incident was captured on the hotel's video surveillance. After the fight, Tupac and his entourage went back to the hotel room where Kadada and Jamala were still waiting. The men were excited and happy. It told the woman how they threw punches like Mike Tyson. Tupac was a funny guy, so the girls laughed it off as he told his animated version of events. He did not mention who the man was or why they even punched him. And it was time for Tupac to get ready for his midnight performance at Club 622. Kadada felt uneasy after hearing about the fight and reminded Tupac to wear his bulletproof vest. It wasn't strange for Tupac to wear a vest, and he did so regularly after his attack in New York. But on that Saturday night, Tupac said it was too hot and that he didn't need to wear a vest. Again, the men left. On their way to Club 662, Tupac and his entourage made a quick stop at Suge Knight's house. 
Shug, who originally came from Compton, was not afraid to advertise the fact that his affiliation was with the Bloods. Although Tupac knew some of the Bloods in his crew, he was not gang affiliated. He specifically didn't like to wear blue or red. In fact, on this particular night, he chose to wear green. The convoy of cars left Suge's house and made its way to Suge's club. As they reached Las Vegas Boulevard, they were driving slowly as they had some time to kill. Suge was driving the black BMW leading the convoy. Driving with him was Tupac. Behind them were Tupac's bodyguard, Frank Alexander, Atlanta rapper Edie I mean. They were followed by three other cars with people associated with Death Row. Just after 11 p.m., they were pulled over by a policeman on a bicycle for driving without license plates and playing the car stereo too loudly. They turned down the music and found the number plates in the trunk of the car Suge was driving, so the officer let them go without a ticket. They turned on the Flamingo Road and stopped behind a car at a red traffic light. Another car with two women drove up next to them at the traffic light on the driver's side and started flirting, asking where they were heading. Tupac and Suge told the woman where they were headed and invited them to join them at the club. Both Tupac and Suge were talking to the ladies and did not notice a white Cadillac pulling up on the passenger side where Tupac was sitting. The car Tupac and Suge was traveling in was effectively boxed in. There was nowhere to go. Out of the back seat window of the Cadillac came a hand holding a gun. And out of nowhere, a rain of bullets showered Suge's car, and it was smoke coloring the streets. Suge Knight will never forget these moments. We heard shots and looked to the right of us. Tupac was trying to get in the back seat, and I grabbed him and pulled him down. The gunshots kept coming. One hit my head. From the car behind them, friends watched as they were being gunned down. It all happened so quick, it took three or four seconds at most, Edie I mean said. The Cadillac sped off as Tupac's bodyguards shot at it. Everyone was numb with shock about what they had just witnessed. Some bicycle cops saw the incident and called for backup. Tupac's bodyguard, Frank Alexander, got out of his car because he was certain both Tupac and Suge were either dead or badly injured. To his surprise, Suge was still alive and started driving off. He made a U-turn, heading back to Las Vegas Boulevard, fleeing from the assailant. Frank got back into his car and followed them. In the confusion of the moment, the bicycle policemen followed the two BMWs, thinking that the men in the BMW were shooting at each other. Shug ran the car into the curb on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Harmon. Police ran to the scene, still thinking the people inside the bullet-riddled black BMW were the assailants rather than the victims. They commanded them to exit the vehicles. Suge, who was shot himself, did not want to leave the badly injured Tupac as he was losing consciousness. Police commanded Suge and the rest of the entourage out of their cars and made them lie down on a tarmac at gunpoint. Frank Alexander told police what had happened and that Suge and Tupac were both victims. Suge Knight was hit by fragmentation but was otherwise unharmed. The gunmen drove off in a white Cadillac. Attention moved to Tupac in the passenger seat of the car, and police struggled to open the door of the BMW. So Suge went across and did it. They managed to pull Tupac out of the car and rush him to University Medical Center. When Tupac arrived, he wasn't conscious anymore. He was rushed into emergency surgery in a massive effort to save his life. Tupac was badly injured. All up, he had received four gunshot wounds. The first bullet went into his hand and damaged his pinky finger. The second bullet went into his thigh bone and ricocheted to his abdomen. The third and fourth bullets went into his chest, penetrated his lung. Surgeons managed to stabilize him for a while. They thought internal bleeding was coming from his lungs, so removed the lung and put him on a respirator. But the internal bleeding persisted. 25-year-old Tupac Shakur was fighting for his life. There were many people in the hospital, eagerly waiting for good news about Tupac's condition. His mother tried her best to stay positive. Kadada was by his side all of the time. Tupac always had a premonition that he would die young. 
When he turned 21, he was surprised that he made it into adulthood alive. Was this premonition coming true right in front of them? Word on the street had it that Tupac's shooting was the result of the friction between the Crip and Blood gangs. While Tupac was fighting for his life in a Las Vegas hospital, a gang war erupted in Compton. The Bloods wanted revenge on the Crips, the mission being to kill a Crip a day. They sent a clear message by executing a number of drive-by shootings. The shootings resulted in the death of three people and left 12 people injured. The youngest victim was a 10-year-old girl who was shot and injured. Police arrested 22 people in connection with this retaliation. Six days after Tupac Shakur was gunned down on the streets of Las Vegas, he succumbed to internal bleeding caused by four gunshots. He was pronounced dead at 4 p.m. in the afternoon of September 13, 1996. His loved ones were with him when he passed away. His stepbrother Mo Prime, who often recorded and performed with Tupac, remembered how Tupac was shaking in his hospital bed. He was fighting to stay alive, a warrior till the very end. There was a lot of pressure on police to solve this case, but so many mistakes were made on the night of the shooting and crucial evidence and witness statements were lost for good. Firstly, the crime scene ended up being where the BMW stopped, not where the shooting had occurred. Bullet casings were either run over by cars or had rolled down the street into the gutter. The passenger in the front seat of the car behind Tupac was in the best position to identify the gunman. 19-year-old Yafu Gaddafi Fula grew up with Tupac and the two were like brothers. He was one of the members of Tupac's backup band, Outlaw Immortals. Yafu confirmed that he could see the gunman from where he was sitting. Police never asked him who it was, just said that he should go down to the police station to make a statement which he never did, and they never followed up on. Yafu left Vegas after Tupac's death, and before he could meet with police to make a statement, he was shot in the back of the head in a housing project in New Jersey on November 10th. Suge Knight went into the Las Vegas Police Department to give a statement three days after the shooting. He brought his lawyers with him and provided no information that could spark a lead. He stated that it all happened very quick and that he did not see the gunman. Security at the MGM Grand could provide police with the CCTV footage of the fight in the lobby on the night of the 7th of September. Police thought this could have been the motive for the shooting. They wanted to know the identity of the man who was beaten up by Tupac and his crew. Security only had Orlando's first name. With help from the Compton police, Las Vegas police managed to identify him as Orlando Baby Lane Anderson from the Compton Southside Crips. At the time, Baby Lane was under investigation for the gunshot murder of another man. Las Vegas detectives went to Compton to learn more about this violent man who had been on the losing end of a fight with Tupac on the night that Tupac was murdered. Compton provided them with a brief history of the rivalry between the Crips and the Bloods and felt that it was more than plausible that Orlando and the Crips killed Tupac as revenge for humiliating and disrespecting one of their members. Yet Las Vegas police did not feel the evidence was concrete enough to make an arrest. Compton homicide investigator Bobby Ladd, who was very familiar with the gangs in the precinct said, We told Vegas right then we thought the Southside Crips were responsible for the murder and that Orlando was the shooter. Las Vegas police could not be convinced after reviewing the footage of the fight. To them, it appeared that Orlando was a stranger to Tupac and that the fight was not the motive for Tupac's murder. On May 29, 1998, Orlando Baby Lane Anderson was shot down in an LA gunfight. At a Compton car wash, Orlando wanted to settle a dispute with another gang member and ended up dead. Police said that his death was unrelated to the Tupac Shakur case. As time went on, concrete leads in Tupac's case ran dry, but conspiracies were flying around the music industry. People were talking about the ongoing gang war between LA's Crips and Bloods and their respective affiliations with East and West Coast rappers. 
Las Vegas authorities were concerned that pursuing this case would end up in a well-published trial and droves of hip-hop artists and gangs would be flooding into their city. It would be detrimental for publicity. People wouldn't feel safe to travel to Las Vegas. This was an attitude that frustrated many dedicated police officers. One theory that was circling through the rumor mill was that Tupac's producer, Suge Knight, was behind the attack. People close to Tupac knew that he was planning on leaving Death Row Records. Although his albums with Death Row were hugely successful, he was ready to leave. Tupac felt Death Row wasn't paying him what he was worth. He was going to start his own label and was done with Suge Knight. People who believed this theory felt that Suge had set up the fight in the lobby to make it look like the night was laden with inter-gang conflict. They found it odd that Orlando got up after his beating and didn't want to press charges. But Suge was in the car when Tupac was shot. Surely, if he had set it up, it would have been too risky. The car was riddled with bullets. There was no way of ensuring Suge would not have been killed himself. Also, in the gang world, People don't trust police, so it would be unusual for someone like Orlando to press charges after a fight. To them, fighting is a part of life. Suge Knight was arrested, though, but not in relation to Tupac's murder. He was arrested for violating the conditions of his parole by beating up Orlando. He denies being involved in the shooting of his label's biggest star. Six years after Tupac's murder, a new theory emerged. In 2002, the Los Angeles Times published a story that pointed fingers to the East Coast rapper, Tupac's once friend, the notorious B.I.G. The year-long investigation done by Chuck Phillips reconstructed the crime and revisited events leading up to it. It says, The shooting was carried out by a Compton gang called the Southside Crips to avenge the beating of one of its members by Shakur a few hours earlier. Orlando Anderson, the crip whom Shakur had attacked, fired the fatal shots. The article claims that Orlando gathered himself after the beating and word about the incident spread like wildfire. Crip's gang members in Las Vegas at the time joined up with Orlando and urged him to retaliate. A beating like that was against the code of ethics of respect and deserved the ultimate payback. The LA Times article also reveals that Biggie Smalls was staying at the MGM Grand under an assumed name on the night of September 7th, 1996. Biggie's presence in Las Vegas and the uproar caused by Tupac's fight with Orlando caused the perfect storm. The Crip guys remembered that Biggie was prepared to pay for a hit on Tupac. They went to him and said they would get rid of Tupac if Biggie were to pay them one million. According to Phillips' article, Biggie agreed, but he had one condition. He handed over a 40 caliber Glock pistol and said that nothing would make him happier than knowing that the bullet that killed Tupac came from his own gun. Taking the gun, Orlando and the other Crips assembled at the Treasure Island Hotel. They hatched the plan to shoot Tupac after his midnight performance at Club 662 when he left the building. At 11 p.m., a group of Crip members left the valet parking at the Treasure Island Hotel in a white Cadillac to go head to Club 662. By a stroke of luck, they came upon Tupac's convoy just off Flamingo Drive and fired 13 shots. They drove away, jumped onto the I-15 highway, and headed straight back to Compton, California. Witnesses saw two Crips in Compton driving a white Cadillac with a rental sticker two days after the attack on Tupac. An informant told the Compton gang unit that the car was taken to a man who did auto body work to repair damage caused by bullets. On the night of the shooting, one of Tupac's bodyguards managed to fire a couple shots at the Cadillac as it sped off. Compton police found a rental agency in Carson that had rented a white Cadillac over the time of the shooting. Officers thought that it was very likely the vehicle used on the night of the crime. They claimed to have sent all the information to Las Vegas police. Las Vegas police claimed they never received the report. In the case of gang killings, finding witnesses is a hard task. People usually distrust law enforcement. 
The consequences of ratting somebody out could be far worse than simply frustrating police officers sniffing around for tips. Also, many of the witnesses had criminal records and did not want to implicate themselves unnecessarily. As was the case with Suge Knight, during an interview with ABC TV's Primetime Live, he alluded to the fact that even if he knew who killed Tupac, there was no way he was telling authorities. He said, It's not my job. I don't get paid to solve homicides. I don't get paid to tell on people. Phillips' article caused a lot of controversy. Biggie Small's family was outraged that he was implicated in Tupac's murder. The family felt that it was irresponsible reporting from the LA Times and wanted to take legal action. In support of their claims, Biggie's family produced invoices showing that he was working in a New York recording studio the night of the drive-by shooting. Biggie's friends also claim he had no gang affiliations. Tupac's mom, Afini Shakur, also didn't believe that Biggie was involved. In March 1997, Biggie talked about the rumor of him ordering a hit on Tupac by saying, I'm not that powerful yet. Within a week of this interview, Biggie would be dead too. He would be gunned down in an eerily similar way to Tupac. Biggie was in Los Angeles for the 11th Soul Train Music Awards on March 8, 1997. He was attending the after party with Sean P. Diddy Combs and his entourage. When things got out of hand, Fire marshals shut the party down and everyone evacuated the club just after midnight. They were driving in convoy with Diddy and his bodyguards in the front car, Biggie and his bodyguards in the middle. There was a third car in their convoy which was cut off and could not join them at the traffic light on Wilshire Boulevard. A black Chevy Impala drove to the passenger side of Biggie's GMC Suburban, pulled out a pistol and opened fire. Biggie was hit by four bullets and was pronounced dead at Cedar sinai Medical Center in the early morning hours of March 9th. As with Tupac's murder, no one has ever been charged in the killing of Biggie Smalls, the notorious B.I.G. When the L.A. Times story broke, implicating Biggie in Tupac's murder, Biggie's mom reached out to Tupac's mom. She wanted them to appeal together for a federal investigation into the murders of their sons. Tupac's legal team said they didn't trust any governmental agency in connection with solving this crime. After Tupac and Biggie's deaths, their mothers appeared together at the 1999 Music Awards. They graced the stage with Will Smith. They were representing their sons and encouraged peace. They pleaded with the rapping community to let their sons' memories inspire and unite them. It was time to lay the weapons down. In the years following their killings, associates of both Tupac and Biggie made comments indicating the two stars, were it not for their deaths, would have reconciled. Tupac sold more records after his death than when he was alive. He broke the Guinness World Record for greatest selling rap artist of all time with a total of 75 million albums sold worldwide. Journalist Chuck Phillips comments on Tupac's death. The slaying of Tupac Shakur silenced one of modern music's most eloquent voices, a ghetto poet whose tales of urban alienation captivated young people of all races and backgrounds. The 25-year-old Shakur had helped elevate rap from a crude street fad to a complex art form, setting the stage for the current global hip-hop phenomenon. Tupac was an artist, and Afini Shakur felt something had to be done to preserve his legacy. She founded the Tupac Amaru Shakur Foundation, or TASF, in 1997. TASF's stated mission is to provide training and support for students who aspire to enhance their creative talents. The foundation hosts day camps for teenagers, offering lessons in creative and performing arts, acting, dancing, writing. The foundation continued to grow and the Tupac Amaru Shakur Center for the Arts opened in Stone Mountain, Georgia in June 2005. They also have a cultural exchange program with Japan and South Africa. In 2007, Afini Shakur was in court again. I was the fighter. She had one more battle to complete. She filed an injunction against Death Row Records, preventing them from selling any of Tupac's unreleased songs. She founded a record label called Amaru Records to release Tupac's songs. 
A total of 150 songs were handed over to Afini. In April of 2012, a hologram of Tupac performed his songs Hail Mary and two of America's Most Wanted with Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre at the Coachella Music Festival. It was like having him back again, if even just for a fleeting moment. Afini Shakur passed away from a heart attack in May 2016. On April 7, 2017, on the first year that he was eligible, Shakur was inducted into the Music Hall of Fame. His friend Snoop Dogg accepted the award on his behalf and had said, Tupac knew he was only human and he represented through his music like no one else. It was a fact he didn't shy away from. He wore it like a badge of honor. With an unapologetic rawness, Pac embraced those contradictions that prove we ain't just a character out of somebody's storybook. To be human is to be many things at once, strong and vulnerable, strong-headed and intellectual, courageous and afraid, loving and vengeful, revolutionary, and oh yeah, don't get a f***ed up, gangster. To this day, nobody has been arrested for the murder of Tupac Shakur, but his legend will live forever as the man who made street rap an art form. If you'd like to read more about this case, have a look at the resources used for this episode in the show notes. You would also enjoy Unsolved, Tupac and Biggie, and the documentary about Biggie Smalls called Notorious, both on Netflix. Afini Shakur produced Tupac, Resurrection, a bio-documentary of Tupac telling his life story in his own words. If you like our podcast, please share with your friends. Also, visit and like our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash evidence locker podcast to see more about today's case. This was the Evidence Locker. Thank you for listening.